Hey, hey, what is up everybody? Welcome back. Today we're talking about a concept in time series analysis called the Ewell Walker method. This video is inspired by a viewer who commented and suggested I talk about this on a previous video. And so I went back, did some research, re-familiarized myself with this, and I found it even more interesting than when I first learned it because I was able to bring in other stuff I learned since then. Stuff in data science, stats, uh, computer science, and relate all this to computational complexity, big O notation, we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but I found it pretty interesting and hope you do too. So we're gonna start with our setup. We are building an ARP, autoregressive P model. And of course we know that looks like this. We're just starting with an AR2 model through this video to keep things simple, but everything we say is gonna to extend to an arbitrary P lag. So that model is gonna be, we're modeling X of T, our time series as phi one, some parameter phi one times the one lag of that time series plus phi2 times two lags of that time series, plus of course our error term in the current time period. So that's our AR2 process. And of course our goal is to estimate phi1 and phi2. So what are phi1 hat and phi2 hat? How are we going to figure those out? So the most easy, most dumb way I can think of is, yeah, this is an AR2 process, but more generally it's just a linear model of two parameters and two features. So why don't we just fall back on the way we estimate the parameters of linear models in OLS? And going back to that notation, we usually call big X our feature matrix, which is an N by P matrix, N being the number of observations we have and P being the number of features we have. Here, that's the same as the lag order of this ARP process. Y is our target variable, which is gonna be a vector in RN. And we know there's a closed form solution for this. That closed form solution is gonna be the parameter estimates are X transpose X. We get that square matrix, that P by P square matrix. We invert it, we multiply that by X transpose Y. So hopefully that's somewhat familiar to you as just the closed form of how we would get the parameters for any OLS, including this ARP, which at the end of the day is just an OLS with P uh, features. It's just that those features happen to be the lagged versions of the process itself. So let's do a little bit of an exercise. Let's go ahead and talk about the computational complexity. In other words, how much uh, computational resources or time is required to get the solution. And we'll break it down step by step because there's some steps that go on here. So first let's look at the X transpose X. X transpose X is the product of a P by N matrix and a N by P matrix. And so if we remember the computational complexity uh, of multiplying two such matrices, it's gonna be an O N squared P operation. Then we have to do the inverse of a P by P matrix. We know the inverse of an arbitrary P by P matrix is going to be OP cubed. There are, of course, optimizations and such we can do, but in general, you're kind of bounded by this OP cubed. Then we multiply by X transpose, again, appealing to the big O of matrix multiplication. That's going to be OP squared N. And then we multiply this uh, vector Y, which is going to be ONP. And assume here that N is going to be bigger than P. So we're going to get OP cubed plus ON squared P. So one question you might have is, hey, there's only two terms here, but there's four terms here. That's because two of these terms get dominated under the assumption that N is larger than P. This ONP certainly gets dominated by the ON squared P because N squared is bigger than N. So in the limit, NP is gonna get dominated by this term. And also OP squared N is gonna get dominated by ON squared P, again, under the assumption that N is much bigger than P. So we have this right here as the overall computational complexity. Now, of course, this is a function of both N and P. So as N, the number of observations we have in our time series, or the amount of time over which we're trying to build this model, or P, the number of lags we have. So this is a small number of P, but in general, you can imagine you have dozen, couple dozen, even hundred uh, different lags you're trying to consider. This could become inefficient. So is there some other way? Is there a more efficient way for us to get these phi1, phi2, all the way to phi p, all these different parameters in our ARP process that is more efficient than this? So to motivate that conversation, let's make an assumption. And that assumption isn't just one of those things that I'm gonna say, okay, let's assume this, it's totally gonna be true. No, it's actually crucial and key to getting the Yule Walker equations to work at all. If this assumption is not met, the U Walker equations, even though we're going to see that they're going to be more efficient than OLS, are not going to work, and so they're completely useless. So I'm mentioning that now, and I'm going to mention that again, and it's written down here. Remember that assumption. We need the time series. We need to know that it's stationary in order for everything that is going to come to work. And you'll see exactly where that assumption comes in and why none of this is going to work if that assumption is not met. So we're going to assume here somehow, whether we were told or whether we calculated it, somehow we know that the time series X sub T is stationary. Now there's a bunch of conditions that go into stationarity, but the only one that's gonna matter for us today is that the covariance 
of the time series and the time series lagged by k is just going to be a function of that lag k. It's just going to be gamma sub k. Now, as opposed to what? As opposed to that being a function of the exact time we measure it as well. Notice that here, the covariance could be a function of t and k, t being the time at which we're looking at it and k being the number of lags between these two periods. It could be a function of both, but we're saying under stationarity, no, it's just going to be a function of k. That's why you write gamma sub k and not gamma sub t and k. So that's going to be the main assumption we need, and you'll see exactly where that comes in. Now what we're going to do is just calculate some of these covariances, starting with the covariance of the time series and itself, which by definition, going back to this definition up here, is going to be gamma sub zero. And what is that going to be? Well, this first x sub t, we can actually just plug in the model itself, being phi one x sub t minus one plus phi two x sub t minus two plus epsilon of t. So that's exactly what I've reproduced right here. So you can see that as the first x sub t and the second x sub t we just leave alone. Now we're going to appeal to the rules of covariances, which means that for these constants, which are phi 1 and phi 2, we can just pull them out of the covariance. And then also for these sums, we can break up the covariance of a sum into the sum of the covariances. So you can re-familiarize yourself with those rules or just take it as given that those are true for covariances. And so doing that, we get phi 1, which gets pulled out, covariance of x sub t minus 1 xt, plus, so this plus is now outside the covariances, phi 2, which is also a constant, so it got pulled out, covariance of x sub t minus 2 xt, and hey, what happened to this epsilon of t? Well, that epsilon of t, under the assumption of the model, is considered just to be white noise, and so when you think about the covariance of white noise and something else, that's just going to be zero, because there's no relationship under the assumption of this model between the white noise and the time series we care about. So that just goes away, which is why you don't see it on this line. So now what is this? What is covariance of x sub t minus 1 xt? Again, going back to this definition, that's just gamma of 1. And what is covariance of x sub t minus 2 xt? Again, going back to this definition, that's just gamma of 2. And folks, this, and I'm going to point to this very explicitly, going from this line to this smaller form here is exactly using that assumption of stationarity. Because if the assumption of stationarity was not true, then I couldn't assume that this covariance between x sub t minus 1 and xt is just a gamma, a function of the lag between them, which is just one time period. I would have to assume it's a function of the t as well. But because we assume it's stationary here, that's what allows us to do this step from here to here right here. So that's our first equation. And now for our second equation, you can go through pretty much the same exercise. Just assume that you're trying to get the covariance of x sub t minus 1 with x sub t. So you would put x sub t minus 1 here, and then with x sub t, and we can go through all the same work. I encourage you to do that exercise for yourself. It's going to be appealing to exact same steps here. You're going to get that the gamma 1 is going to be equal to phi 1 gamma 0 plus phi 2 gamma 1. So now we have two equations. We have this equation here, and we have this equation here. Now there's a lot of symbols floating around, but let's keep stock of which variables we can calculate and which ones are unknowns. Now the gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, what are those again? Those are the auto covariances between the time series and the lag version of the time series. Those can be calculated empirically. So we have all this data. We have our n by p matrix of data. So we can go ahead and just calculate those. And each one of those is going to be an ON operation. And how many of them are there? For a general ARP process, there's P of them. So to calculate those auto covariances empirically is going to be ON times P. So that's going to be part of the computational complexity of the Ewell Walker equations and applying them to get the coefficients that we don't know. So here I've written in matrix vector form the exact two equations we have here. The first equation basically is saying gamma 0, gamma 0 is equal to phi 1 times gamma 1, phi 1 gamma 1, plus phi 2 times gamma 2, phi 2 gamma 2. And the next equation is exactly this equation down here. So nothing new is being said here, I'm just packaging the knowledge that we got from this step and this step into a matrix vector form. And again, now this matrix full of gammas and this vector full of gammas is known. We calculated those empirically, which took us O n times P. Recall that. What is still unknown is this phi 1, phi 2. Those are the exact parameters that we're trying to estimate. Now I'm going to give a simple name to some of these so we can write them more succinctly. We're going to call this matrix here big A because it's a matrix of the auto covariances. And we're going to call this vector here little a because it's a vector of the auto covariances. And just putting the left hand side on the right, right hand side on the left, we're going to get A times this phi. This phi here is just going to be the collection of all the phi 1, phi 2, all the way to phi P. So it's going to be A times phi is equal to little a here. And now, now here is the part of the video that is unlocking why this is going to be more efficient than just the generic OLS solution. A, big A, is going to be what's called a toplets matrix. 
Now, Toplex matrix is a very cool kind of matrix where if you look at the diagonal and all of the off diagonals going either up or down, all of those diagonals and off diagonals are going to contain the same exact item. Now, you can kind of see it here. You can see on this diagonal, of course, there's just gamma ones. On this off diagonal, well, it just has one element. So whatever that is, it would cause the condition to be met. But you can see here, this is a Toplitz matrix, but I want you to get a better idea of it. So I'm gonna show you a Toplitz matrix, the corresponding Toplitz matrix for an AR5 process on the screen right now. And hopefully you can see here, if, if we look through all of the diagonals and off diagonals, those are the same exact element. Those have the same exact element. Crucially, you might think this is a symmetric matrix or related to a symmetric matrix, but they're fundamentally different things. Toplitz matrices and symmetric matrices are not the same thing. Here's an example of a Toplitz matrix that is not symmetric, and here's an example of a symmetric matrix that's not Toplitz. So they are different things. Now, why did I spend all this time and bring up this new term called a Toplitz matrix? Because taking the inverse of a Toplitz matrix is not an OP cubed operation. Because of this form of the Toplitz matrix, and that's not something I'm gonna dive into this video, it's not all about Toplitz matrices and how they work and why taking the inverse is more efficient. But there is a method called Levinson-Durbin recursion that you can apply if you know the matrix is Toplitz, like we have for these right here that is gonna allow us to take the inverse of that matrix in OP squared time instead of OP cubed time. So what that allows us to unlock is that we have this matrix vector multiplication, A phi is equal to little a. We can invert this matrix A. So we're gonna get that the parameter estimates phi hat are gonna be A inverse little a. And what was the computational complexity of that? Well, taking the inverse of A is gonna be OP squared thanks to the fact that it's a Toplitz matrix. And then what is the uh, multiplication of a P by P? And then what is the dimension of A going to be? A is going to be uh, P elements as well. So that's going to be P squared as well. So it's still OP squared. So overall, the computational complexity of using the Yule Walker equations is going to be OP squared coming from this step here, plus ONP from getting those autocovariances in the first place. And so how does that compare to the OLS? So this is OP squared plus ONP. This was OP cubed, which is less preferred, which is more complex than OP squared right here. And here we have ON squared P, which again is more computationally complex than just doing ONP. So that's why the Yule Walker equations are so powerful when we're able to use them, because they drop the computational complexity by a lot, especially that's gonna be helpful when N and P are rather large and when these differences actually manifest themselves in terms of how long it takes to get these uh, parameter estimates. So hopefully that math explained why the Yule Walker equations are so powerful. But the main thing I want to get across in this video is that remember, remember we're only allowed to use the Yule Walker equations if we know the time series is stationary or if we did some kind of test to check that it's stationary. And if we're being really diligent, we should probably involve the big O notation of that test in this computational estimate as well, because we need to do that test to even know if we can apply this. And so Granted, it should be included here as well. But somehow if someone just tells you it's stationary or if you're just willing to do a visual stationarity check and trust that, then the Yule Walker equations will be preferred to just using the usual OLS estimation. But if you are wrong about the stationarity assumption or if the time series is not stationary, yes, this will be more efficient. It's gonna give you garbage estimates. It's gonna give you the wrong estimate. So it's kind of a non-starter at that point. So hopefully that helped to understand the Yule Walker equations. And yes, we did this for an AR2 process, but you can just extend all of this math to a general uh, ARP process. You'll find that this big A matrix is still toplets um, and everything will still work as expected. So hopefully you enjoyed that video. Please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. Have a great rest of your day and I'll see all you wonderful people next time.